the thumbs up. Okay, I got the thumbs up. So, so this is our first seminar of the fall semester. Uh, and one of the first where we are in person or hybrid, and it's my first time hosting a hybrid seminar. So I hope I get all the technology um, correct. So I wanna, I'm Alan Berkowitz. I'm delighted to be co-hosting with Ashley Allred, the, um, our seminar guest for today. And just to review some logistics, we have a bunch of people online and you should feel free to right now, tell us where you're from um, if you want in the chat. And you can also use the chat to communicate any technical difficulty, difficulties that you're having. And we'd like you to use the Q&A for questions that you have. And at the end, I will um, read some of the questions from the Q&A and Michelle will field correct questions from the audience here. She'll try to remember to repeat the questions from the audience so that the remote people can hear the question. And, um, and that's, that's our plan. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Michelle Smith uh, to Cary Institute for her first visit. Um, Michelle is um, just recently became a senior associate dean for undergraduate education at the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell. She's also the Ann S. Bowers professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, which is the department that I was in at Cornell many, many years ago. Um, and uh, before that, she's kind of moved up the ranks as if um, from associate then to, to full professor at Cornell. Um, she spent time, uh, she got her graduate degree at the University of Washington. Um, she got a master's from the University of Dayton in Ohio and her undergrad was at Hanover College in Hanover, Indiana. Um, as different from the other Hanover that some of us are familiar with. She's been a, she's worked at University of Maine and um, also at UC Boulder. Um, so she has a really wonderful background in both biology and more recently education. And she's here to talk with us today about what our students learning and experiencing in field courses. So welcome. So hi everybody here and online. I really, really appreciate this invitation. I also understand this is the first time you guys have had cookies and coffee in a long time <laughs> before seminars, and I feel really honored to be attached to the return of cookies. So thanks for inviting me. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, primarily undergraduate field courses and how we're looking to measure what's happening in those um, with our students. And I like this project for lots of reasons, but one of them is the team that's worked together on the research questions I'll talk about today. Um, you can see it spans a lot of different career stages, all the way from undergraduate through faculty. Also, you'll see departments you recognize, like the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. We have some physicists involved, some people from the museum, some librarians. So it's just been a wonderful way to see how a group of people can work on some of these larger issues that touch upon ecology education. All right, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about why we should even bother studying field courses. We'll talk about some of the student outcomes broadly. We'll talk about some new research where we think about how we can measure critical thinking in these courses. And then finally end with how we're looking at the breadth of student affect or how they're feeling um, when they are in these field courses. So we may all have a different definition of what a field course is. And so for the purpose of today, we're going to talk about how a field course is when students leave the classroom to learn about learn outdoors about a natural phenomenon. So essentially what we're looking at at the undergraduate level is the students go outside and learn about something. So I know we have all had various field experiences in our lives. So with each other, maybe we can move around um, the room here, or if you're on Zoom, perhaps you can put a comment in the Q&A so with each other first, share a few words about what your first field course experience was like. So get to know each other and share a few and we'll come back in a second. Okay. 
All right, so we together. Um, I'd love to hear a few words if people would be willing to volunteer what they talked about. Um, anybody willing to share a few words about their first field experience? Alan can also look on the Zoom. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I'll just repeat for the hybrid audience, it was positive but overwhelming, a lot of changes in your country, but you felt really comfortable when you were able to be outside. Okay, great, other, other experiences. Thank you, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I'll repeat this. So at Cornell, a lot of fast paced, rapid memorization. So maybe a little bit different than you might have expected to be. Okay, thank you. Other thoughts? Yes. Okay, so a lot of investigation, walking around, storytelling, you felt a distinct difference from the lecture that you enjoyed. Great. Take one more. Yes. Uh, during undergrad, in the field class, you know, it's my first outdoor experience in my wildlife changes, and I was taken out in the middle of the forest at a down to the cemetery, and it was awesome. It was not alone, and I didn't know what I was doing, but I thought it was so cool. Okay, so we have another college experience taken outdoors, dumped into, in your words, <laughs> so a little bit. And um, this was overwhelming, but you thought it was really cool, something you had never experienced before. Um, great. And I share a lot of this. My first was when I was a graduate student, actually, I didn't have much undergraduate field work. Um, and I was out at Friday Harbor, Washington. For the first summer, I lived in Seattle, and I assumed Seattle uh, summers were similar to Indiana summers and in that they were 100 degrees and humid. And I showed up with two pairs of shorts and three t-shirts and really <laughs> regretted how cold I was. Um, the closest I've ever come to hypothermia was actually that July um, <laughs> in Freddy Harbor. So a mix, right? So these new experiences, things that we're unsure about, but also things that really piqued our interest, something that was exciting. So we know from the literature that field courses offer a number of valuable learning opportunities. So they often narrow opportunity gaps. So a lot of us talked about this being our first experience, this first opportunity to learn in this way. They provide experiential learning for sure. Um, environmental literacy, we learn about the places around us, lots of teamwork skills typically, um, but they also face challenges. So compared to other areas of undergraduate research, there's less research. So there's lots more about genetics and molecular biology or physiology than field courses. Um, often there's increased effort, as many of us know, to teaching these and sometimes risk. And so there's often a conversation with the institution about how much effort and risk versus reward for students. And then often we find that participation might not be reflective of student diversity. So we can think about racial diversity or students with disabilities and making sure they have access to these spaces and these opportunities as well. So what we wanted to do as a group is first think about what do we know about student outcomes in undergraduate field courses right now? So let's just take a snapshot of what's known in the field. 
And to do that, we conducted what's called a scoping review. And this is a systematic approach to synthesizing evidence. And it focuses on broader topics that have heterogeneous study designs. So you might be more familiar with a meta-analysis. Typical meta-analysis would be something like you're testing a drug, let's say a drug that helps with COVID symptoms. You have two groups. Um, they don't know if they're getting a drug or a placebo, and then you're measuring how likely they are to have COVID symptoms at the other end. And that study is repeated in different populations and different circumstances. Those kind of studies lend themselves really well to meta-analyses because the techniques and the experimental design are similar. For people who have worked in education, you know that there really is not a single standard approach to studying education. And so we needed a way to um, account for these heterogeneous study designs. So the goal is to identify available evidence, to provide an inclusive look at the state of the field, but the most important thing is to determine opportunities for growth. So where should we go next based on what we know now? So here's how we did this scoping review. We designed a search protocol that with the help of the librarian in this project, we posted online. It's a really critical component because it allows you to start at the beginning and stick to your protocol and not change um, mid-design. And we ran searches um, through various databases. So things like PubMed or Web of Science, we also searched um, some amount of gray literature, and we ended up with a little bit over a thousand articles. When we searched, um, you know, things posted online that weren't posted in the, or indexed in the same way, we came up with a few extra articles. It turns out those were all duplicates, so we had um, a little bit over a thousand records to, to start with. So then from there, we did screening of the titles and abstracts of all of these um, typically articles. And we excluded a lot. So we excluded over 800 of these records. So what were our inclusion and exclusion criteria? So in order to be included in our study, we needed the article to focus on higher education institutions. Um, we made the choice to focus on, at least to start, universities based within the US, although I imagine there will be plenty of other studies and other um, countries looking at similar questions. Um, we did in fact include study abroad programs. So if it was a US institution that was doing a study abroad field course, it was included in our study. We were looking for undergraduates who are taking a field course for credit. So these weren't volunteer opportunities or extra opportunities um, outside of the normal academic year. We needed the classes to go outside. So that was one criteria and they needed to be in the natural sciences. Um, they had to have some evaluation of something that happened in the course. Um, so it could be what factors influenced undergraduate participation or persistence or student outcomes. We focused on between 2000 and 2020 when we started this um, so that we could have a contemporary look at what was going on in field courses. They needed to describe original research and have some sort of qualitative and or quantitative research methods. And then just because um, our team primarily uh, worked in English, the articles needed to be written in English. So the way this would work is that we'd have a computer program and you would log into it and it would give you titles and abstracts of articles. You would kind of have your assignment for the day. And so I would do it and someone else on the team would do it. And the computer program would say, did we match in our assessment of the article included versus excluded? If me and the other person on the team match, the article is moved over to that bucket. If we disagreed, a third person, unbeknownst to them, would come in and rank it, and then that third person would be a tiebreaker vote. So once we finished the titles and abstracts, we are pretty liberal with that because we didn't want to accidentally exclude anything. We assessed the full text, so we went all the way through these criteria again and looked through the entire full text. And we ended up with a total of 61 articles where we could extract and analyze data based on our search criteria. So here is what we focused on for this study. So what study designs, methods, and measures have been used in undergraduate field courses, what factors are influencing undergraduate participation, and what knowledge effective behavioral and skills-based outcomes have been reported. So here we have the frequencies. Um, you can see the publication year. There's a little bit of variation, but at the most, we had eight articles published according to our criteria in any given year. Um, just over half were from the geosciences with the biological sciences and environmental research making up the other group. 
So what we found is most were published as peer-reviewed original research articles. Um, there were some thesis and dissertation chapters. Um, if we found a published article based on a thesis or dissertation chapter, we took the published article um, because typically that was published after and synthesis of the work. We had a few reports and a book chapter. Um, we found that most uh, used some sort of mixed methods, so some combination of qualitative and quantitative assessment. But what was really interesting is we found that the majority of the articles used anecdotal evidence. So it seemed like the students got better at the skill at the end of the semester by, by me as the instructor watching them. Or here's a quote that we picked without any process of how they analyzed quotes from student surveys. And so I think this is a real area in which overall the field can grow using some standard methodology to be able to change it from anecdotal evidence um, into more empirically based study. So what are some of the barriers people reported? Well, not often were barriers reported in these articles. Um, if they were, the most common was economic cost followed by physical factors. So whether or not somebody could engage in the work, um, some emotional, some course-based factors, the time commitment was sometimes listed and then field conditions. Um, it was interesting. We read a lot of fascinating stories about what happened on various field experiences um, added into the method. So kind of, enjoyable to see what uh, various things happen to field courses. Um, cost, uh, so this is just the x-axis is just expanded out. So you can see ranged from um, $0 or free to upwards of $8,000, um, which may or may not have included the plane ticket to get there. So there can be some amount of costs. Almost none of the articles talked about any fundraising or scholarships available uh, for their field research. Um, here's what we found with student demographics. So it was rarely reported even to say who in general participated in the course. Um, about 40% reported some amount of gender, class standing, you can see um, going down. Uh, we only had, I think, one article that talked about first generation status. So it's important that we understand who's taking the courses and whether or not some of the experiences we're measuring are um, differing based on some of these factors, especially as we're trying to open up field courses to a diverse set of individuals. So here's how things um, spread out when we're looking at what the articles were about. You can see that the most here on the left, we're looking at knowledge gains of the students. So roughly half the articles. And then we have spreads across affect, behavior, and skills based. And these aren't mutually exclusive, but you can really see where knowledge is the big measure here. But when we were all talking about our experiences, we mentioned a little bit about knowledge, but pretty much these effective skills that we um, gained. And so we'll talk a bit about thinking about how to measure those today as well. So the lessons we learned is that field courses have these unique barriers for student participation. And as a giant field, we should be better about um, recording those and thinking about how to solve them. Um, reporting of knowledge-based outcomes is currently more common than the others, but that there's lots of room to measure effective behavioral and skills-based outcomes. And the one I just wanna stress and stress for this audience too, is there are many exciting and important opportunities for future research in this area. What we found is this is a field that is ready to go and ready to grow. Um, and so hopefully we can get more people involved in work here. So I'm gonna focus on two follow-up questions. Um, the first question is that here, oops, I knew I was gonna do that. Here we go. Um, the first question is that here, we're gonna think about critical thinking and how to measure that. And then the affect um, in field courses. So we'll launch right into the critical thinking. So how can critical thinking be measured in field courses? So we may all have different definitions of what critical thinking is. We know employers really want students who are critical thinkers, and that's one of the skills that they look to in applicants. Um, and so what we're gonna use today as a definition is that critical thinking concerns evidence-based ways in which individuals make decisions about what to trust and what to do. And so why should we study it? Aside from the fact that employers are really interesting in these skills, interested in these skills, well, first is that vision and change, which outlines what undergraduate biology students should be able to do, calls for the development of curriculum that enhances students' ability to think critically. 
the four DEE framework, which Alan um, was key in implementing out of ESA, also includes critical thinking. So this is a framework that includes designing and critiquing investigations, and that's specifically called out in the ecology practices dimension. And that we know current issues in ecology are often integrated into political discourse and they can be distort, distorted. And so we really want our students to come out with knowledge about when they're seeing things about environmental regulations or hunting regulations, a way to evaluate and determine the trustworthiness of that information. So if you go and look online, you will see you can access some current critical thinking measurements. Um, none specifically focus on ecology. To be quite frank, most present genetics or molecular biology scenarios in which students will respond to them. Um, many are open response where students write about an experiment or write about what they see, which is a fine way to assess students, but doesn't scale really well in large enrollment classes. And it makes it really difficult for people to give these types of assessments if they can't quickly score them. And then many are not freely available, so they're not available for the public um, to use, which is a limitation. So what we set out to do was to develop the Biology Lab Inventory of Critical Thinking and Ecology, or EcoBlick for short. Um, we wanted to offer a closed response, freely available way to measure critical thinking for ecology students and in ecology contexts. And we ended up working with physicists because they had been thinking about this already for introductory physics courses. So we were taking the structure they developed for physics and obviously changing out the scenario a bit and looking at different ecology contexts. So the way we did this is we did a literature search, we looked at the available instruments, and we created some open response versions just as a starter. And we administered those to students. So in this case, we wanted students to write a lot about the scenario because we wanted to pick up their answers in order to develop a closed response version. So we first wanted to just see what they were saying, which would allow us to tweak our answer choices. So they weren't just coming from a bunch of academics thinking about this, but they also were rooted in what students were thinking. So then we engage in this loop where we come up with some closed response questions based on what the students said, and we administer to them, to them. So we're looking at thousands of students across multiple institutions, and we're using various statistical algorithms to see how students are doing and how the assessments are reacting. At the same time, we ask experts to give us feedback on the questions. So we have this statistical input and this expert feedback. And this is really important because if we want people to put this into their classrooms, we need ecologists to value the questions and to understand where they're coming from and offer commentary. And then we do something that's actually a ton of fun where you sit down with students and you have them work through the assessment live with you sitting right next to them. And you're constantly saying, oh, why did you answer that? What are you thinking about here? And so what we're looking for is this loop to go around where statistically the questions are operating like we would predict. Experts, while they will always offer comments on questions, are generally happy with the questions. And when students are doing think aloud interviews, we know what they're thinking when they're taking a particular stance on an answer so that the choice they're making aligns with predictable thinking. All right, so we have a few different question prompts. I'm just gonna go through one here. So the, this one set up is that two groups of biologists want to know how the presence of a great horned owl influences the amount of time that mice spend feeding. These are purposely very basic scenarios that we set up for the students. So they'll be accessible to introductory ecology um, courses. So in one case, after they collect mice in the field, the biologists bring them into a lab setting. They divide the mice into room one and two, and they look at feeding behavior in room one, and in room two, they're playing a owl call in the background, and then they're comparing the two. In the other, they set up this field experiment with cages and cameras, and in this case, they have a night without an owl flying around above, and then a night with an owl flying around above, and they're collecting similar data about how much time the mice are spending at their food bowls. So I just wanted to say that the students see a number of different features associated with these two experiments. And in some cases, like obviously here, the features differ. So on the left, we have an owl call, call. On the right, we have a live owl. Sometimes the features are the same. So both use these infrared cameras to um, track behavior. 
And the one thing you should know is it's not as if the lab did everything great and the field did everything terrible or vice versa. There are strengths and weaknesses to each of these, just like in all our work, there are strengths and weaknesses to the approach. So the students aren't really comparing one good and one bad, but rather two experiments where there's a lot of nuance um, about the different features the biologists used. Okay, so what to trust? How do we figure out? So we first just present the students with some data and ask them to tell us what they see as the conclusion from the study. We actually aren't scoring, the students don't know this, we're actually not scoring this. In general, students will pick out the patterns that we expect and we're really just trying to make sure they're reading the question and making a reasonable um, approach to the answer. So that's what this question is first starting to do. But then we dig into it and say, now evaluate what you saw. So we're gonna call these individual evaluation questions. So for example, there's a whole long list of these, but they look at the lab setting and they're asked, performing the study in a laboratory, would you say that's a one weakness to four strength? And they go on and they rate these different components. So they do that individually, separately for the lab and the field experiment. And then we have a compare and contrast. So after they've done it individually, they compare the lab and the field settings. So in this case, it says, how do you think the lab and the field groups performed in the following category? Again, a long list, this is just one example. So they use an appropriate study setting. So in the lab, the cages were in the lab, and in the field, the cages were in an outdoor enclosure. And they say if they thought the lab group was more effective, field group was more effective, both were highly effective or both groups were minimally effective. And so what we wanted to see is how do students critically evaluate aspects of the research studies when they're looking at one study at a time versus comparing and contrasting the two. Okay, so a brief tutorial about how I'm gonna share these results. So on the y-axis, we have the lab group. So that's their individual rating looking at the lab group. On the x-axis, we have the field group. So this is their individual rating on the field group. And then a series of pie charts are going to come up to show the compare question. So in this case, the student would say individually for whatever trait it was or whatever feature of the experiment it was, the lab group did an excellent job separately. They would say, oh, same thing. We thought the field group did an excellent job. And then when they're asked, well, who did it better? they would say, oh, both groups did an excellent job. And so they would end up in this quadrant up here. Now, these are not the data <laughs> from this experiment, but this is what an idealized plot would look like. So if the students thought, oh, the lab group was doing an excellent job, field group, not so much. When I am asked to compare and contrast, I say lab, they would end up in this top left in the blue circles here. Same thing if they thought the field group was much better, they would say the field group did great, lab group did terrible, field is better in these green circles. If they thought everybody did a terrible job, they would end up in this orange. And if they thought both groups were doing great, this burgundy color here. So I know these circles are all the same size, but in just a second, when I show you the actual data, the size of the pie charts will be scaled to the frequency of the responses. Larger the pie chart, more students fell into that category. And here is what we actually saw. So in general, we saw that students were more positive than negative about these various features, but it didn't actually follow our idealized plot. In fact, we see a lot more variation that even though separately, they would have ranked these two field and lab groups great, when asked to compare, they're actually becoming more discerning. And so to summarize this, what we would say is that if you look at the lab setting alone, kind of think everything's going great. You look at the field setting alone, also think everything's going great. But when you're suddenly asked to compare the two, you become much more discerning about making these comparisons. So then we got to thinking, well, what's the point of these individual evaluation questions? Are they structuring things so that students can look through them carefully so they're more prepared to make the comparison? Or are they serving any function at all? So we decided to take a group who was taking the assessment from multiple institutions, and we gave half of them the individual evaluation questions, so just like we saw before. And the other half, we just omitted those. We just went straight to the group comparison. And so before I do the big reveal of what we found, take a moment with those around you and talk a bit about whether or not you think these individual evaluation questions matter. Do students need to consider things individually 
before they compare and contrast. And then when we get done talking about it, we'll vote. So talk with each other and we'll come right back. All right, are we ready to start to vote? So if you think they make a difference, hold up one finger. If you don't think they make a difference, hold up two. And I can summarize for our friends at home. <laughs> I see people looking around. All right, it looks like we have a pretty healthy mix of ones and twos. Great. What did you talk about with your the people around you? Why, why are you thinking one or two? Yes. We caution in that of it, um, the initial individual evaluation that helps you to minimize each of the approaches, even if they have pre existing bias that one might become superior to the mm. initial return of the experiment, you might just fall back on what they like better. Okay, great. So, just to repeat for the audience at home, they thought that this group thought that individual evaluation questions were important because students might have a bias. They might always think like lab is better or field is better. And so it would help them um, not have that. Great, thanks. Other thoughts? I also saw some too. It's all a guess for everybody in here. There's no right or wrong answer to it. You kind of mentioned that it's results that when they individually look at them, it didn't match what they ended up saying. Yeah. With when they had to compare them. So part of me feels like you could argue that that's the that would be too. Okay. Okay, so the comment was I did actually mention that when, when they were looking individually, they thought everything was great that they had this more discerning skill. So maybe it could be too. Maybe the maybe it doesn't matter for them to go through and think everything's great. Any other thoughts? All right. So the way we're going to read this is we have a number of these study features here. Okay, so these are just different study features we have. On the bottom here, we have lab, field, both, or neither. neither. So these are the group comparison questions. On the left side, it's with the evaluation questions. So they had those individual evaluation questions. And then on the right, it's without. And then in, I think we looked up actual Cornell red color, we go from the frequency of nobody picking this all the way to everybody on the right. So if the patterns of these heat maps come out the same, then the individual evaluation questions didn't matter. They weren't really serving a function. And if they come out different than they were serving a function. And lo and behold, here's what we found. <laughs> Nearly identical patterns with and without these individual evaluation questions actually did not seem to be making a difference in how the students um, were figuring out what to, to trust. And so students do not compare the lab and the field groups differently when these individual evaluation questions were asked. Um, obviously, I'm just showing you a mouse example here. We repeated this with bass and mayflies. We also repeated this with uh, masses on a string and a pulley system in physics. And we saw the exact same patterns over and over and over again. There's something very powerful about this compare and contrast to the students. So what does this mean for all of us here who um, may be working with students? It helps students 
to certain information about experimental design, consider just providing them two scenarios and having them go ahead and compare and contrast. And obviously two scenarios takes more time to write and to read, but to save students time, you don't need them to sort of march through each scenario individually. You can go straight to this comparing and contrasting questions. So what are we working on next? Well, um, I told you at the beginning, uh, the definition of critical thinking was what to trust and what to do. And so we also have asked students about what these biologists should do next. And we have been comparing them to what experts, which are ecologists in the field answer compared to students. And this is just one subset of examples looking at only the lab situation with the um, uh, owl call playing. So um, we do see some similarities, like both the students and the experts thought they should increase their sample size of mice in the study. But what we are finding consistently when we run these different scenarios in both biology and physics is that experts are the only ones saying things about conducting statistical analyses. So again, thinking about how do we really help students think about what to do next and how does the role of um, tools like statistics um, play? in their decision making. Okay, now for our last research question, looking at affect in field courses. So for this study, we wanted to see um, within the context of historically how we've taught field courses, what sort of things students are saying about how they feel about their experience. Um, and so there've been a number of documented effective learning outcomes in field courses. So they are engaging students through self-reflection. There's often, as you'll see, even in the study, a journaling component. There's cooperative learning where they're working together. Often they're doing some sort of experiment and they're learning about the place around them. Um, there's also been documented evidence that field courses build confidence, they add value, they foster science identity, and they connect students to a place. So in order to look at that, we looked at an introductory field biology course at Cornell. Um, this one was actually taught during the pandemic. So that's why we have all these images of students outside, even with their masks on. It's a one hour lecture and two, three hour field labs uh, per week. The students walk and learn. Um, so it's student directed. They are provided with some amount of field equipment. But as we found um, when looking at their journals, uh, students are asked to dress for the field and weather. We have a really great um, student story about wearing white pants on a field trip and having to meet her mom afterwards and um, the, the destruction of those white pants. So afterwards, um, students after each lab were asked to provide information about the location that they were, the experiment they did, their lab activities and their results. And then the focus of today is this open-ended reflection. So looking at what did they think about the experience? What did they learn? And what did they take away from it? And that's the piece that we're going to study here. So what we wanted to do with these field journals and these reflections is better understand their experiences. We wanted to develop a framework of how we could assess um, the effective outcomes using field journal reflections, and then ultimately form and improve field course design. So for this process, what we did is we started with 743 journal, journal, total journal entries from fall 2019. And we had to start by establishing a code book. So how would we analyze these field journal entries? Because as you can imagine, they can be all over the place with what students say. So there is a model of effective domain in geosciences. So we used that and we did our best to code to that. It turns out there's some features that are different between biology and geosciences, such as connection to nature, which was not mentioned in the geosciences domain. And what we do is just jot those down as we were feeling where this original framework was falling a little bit short for us. So then we added to our code book to um, come up with something that would also honor biology. Then we had three coders in four different rounds independently code 5% of the data. So they had the same data. They would each independently code it, and then they would come back and see how they coded it and where they had differences and similarities. And then we would refine the codes based on those meetings. Once we were happy with the codes that we had and they felt like they were representing the variation we were seeing in the data set, two coders independently coded 30 journal reflections, so the same journal reflections, and we calculated inner reader reliability. It was quite high, anything over 60% 
<coughs> is usually pretty high. This is near perfect alignment. So then we could divide people up and two coders coded half of the data set. And if they had anything they weren't sure about, they would meet and talk about it. So here's what we found when we looked across all these journals, that students writing fell into these five areas, identity, which included both scientific and personal, motivation, uh, both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, but also things like environmental motivation, self-efficacy and self-determination, connections to nature. They wrote a lot about the aesthetic. They wrote about organisms and their attachment to place. Pro-social opportunities to engage with each, with each other. This was one of the few in-person classes in fall of 2019. So this had an added um, advantage of them being able to be outside with each other, but connecting with each other. And then emotion, both activity focused emotion and outcome fo focused. So I won't have time to go through all of these, but I thought I would um, show you a bit about identity and how that comes up in these student journals. So again, including both scientific and personal. So when we look at scientific, we would code things like what makes me feel like a field biologist, what affirms my major or career intentions, my past experience with field work. So some students felt insecure because they felt they were lacking experience their classmates had. Some felt pretty confident because they had experiences their classmates didn't have. And then personal, so what I like and dislike, which we heard a bit about um, our first field experiences, where I come from and how I grew up and the connections in between. <laughs> so let's look at one of these. So this shows how scientific identity and what makes me feel like a field biologist would come out in their writing. So standing under the snow on Turkey Hill, for those of you who are not familiar with Ithaca, this is a hill that tends to get more snow than Ithaca does. And earlier, I felt like a true scientist completing valuable work. These kind of statements about them feeling like a true scientist showed up really early and persisted throughout the whole semester. And then this, which I'm sure it could be easy to relate being closer to the city here. It's amazing to see the diversity of birds that live in Ithaca since being from Yonkers, the only wild birds I ever see are pigeons, sparrows, crows, and geese. So really opening up this whole new world to students is a um, reflection of their personal identity or where they come from. And then there's lots of intersections. So in this case, we talked about fishing, how they connected that to their family, um, but they never really learned about the different species in play in the lake. It's been a while since I've talked to people. Okay, so what have we learned? Well, we learned a lot about these different um, framework components and that students discuss personal and scientific identities throughout the semester, and it comes up almost at week one. The field labs we know can help to increase science identity. We showed that here and in other settings. And we know that increased in science identity increases motivations to persist in STEM fields, educational success, produce um, pursuit of scientific careers and sense of belonging. And so if we can foster and pick up on these science identity features early in our experiences with students and help them um, expand on them, we may be able to make a difference in how the students see themselves not only in the course, but in science more broadly. So we're looking at all of these different codes. I thought this group would be particularly interested in the connections to nature, the organisms. So this is the breakdown of the organisms that they mentioned when they were writing freely. And you can see that reptiles and amphibians um, sparked a lot of their interest, but we were also really happy to see plants um, showing up quite frequently in their writing. <coughs> so what does this mean for how this can be used more broadly? Well, we don't expect everyone to go through 700 plus journal entries and carefully code them. But now that we have this framework where we know that identity, motivation, connection to nature, pro-social opportunities and emotions are important, we can then look to the literature to see how these things can be measured. And if some of these are really important learning goals for your program or your course, you can pick up on them as journal prompts that the students respond to. And I just put a few examples here, um, but you can, Think of other examples that might fit more closely to your scenario. And so that way you can monitor this, especially if it's a goal for your program, and develop um, additional opportunities for students to engage and think about um, these experiences um, during the program. So overall today, I've hoped you I've showed you that field courses are um, 
important to study, but we have a long way to go. They offer some unique barriers for student participation, but once we understand that, we can open them up more. Most people are measuring knowledge, which is great, but there are other things like effective behavioral and skills-based outcomes that we're encouraging people to look at as well. Um, specifically one, critical thinking. So just as a practical thing, you can provide students with two experimental designs and focus on the compare and contrast. And the EcoBlick tool, we're in the process of finalizing that. So if people are interested, it's an online tool that will allow you to measure critical thinking if that's um, useful for your group. And then finally, we can use things like journaling, like traditions that we have in this field to measure the breadth of student affect and that students we know now are picking up on personal and science identities in the field and how can we capitalize on them to grow our programs. So I will stop there and take questions. And again, acknowledge this really wonderful team that came together. And thanks so much for the invitation today. I want to remind the virtual audience to type questions into the Q&A if you have any. And we'll start by fielding questions here in the live audience. Yes. Thanks. Uh, the second part of your talk, I was thinking about the point you made about students not calling out, oh, people should be consistent. So yeah. <laughs> what do you think of this is the, the two steps? Yeah. The opportunities for doing that in community buildings. Yeah. Okay, so first I'm just going to repeat the question for the audience on Zoom. So the fact that um, experts will immediately jump to picking out statistics, but students won't do that. We obviously have students take statistics courses. But what are sort of our opportunities to engage with that in um, our field-based courses? Yes, I completely agree. Um, I think we've done a bit of statistics is taught over here. It's taught in the math department. It's taught elsewhere. Um, and I think even when we're looking at it, we're usually asking them, um, evaluate this scenario and these statistics, what conclusion do you make? We rarely talk about it as the next step to solving a problem. So I even think easy ways like not including the statistics initially when you're presenting data and letting them decide, okay, what would we do? How would we show these are the same or different? Letting them sort of engage in that as the next step rather than um, something to reflect back on might be an important thing to try next. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so to repeat for the audience at home, the question was, you know, if students are feeling like scientists in field courses, you know, regardless of the careers that they're entering into, should we be doing more in the intro courses to give them these experiences and help them see the world of science? Um, yes, I totally agree. One of the things we're really interested in is looking towards intro ecology courses that have a smaller field component, right? So um, they might be classes with hundreds of students, but that they go outside maybe a little bit, you know, around here in the fall. So sort of how can we engage that? How does that look compared to a whole semester course outside? In addition to that, I've been working on getting more summer research opportunities for students, but specifically targeting students who this is their first opportunity to do research because I don't know if this happens at other places, but at Cornell, faculty will look through CVs and they're looking for the most, the most experience, most courses, the highest GPA. But giving students that first opportunity early when they have really nothing to put um, on their CV, trying to promote that. And then we've been trying to look at their science identity through those. It's just early days, we're just wrapping up this summer experience. Um, what I can say is that if you look overall, their identity gained from pre to post, but when we look in between, it went up and down and up and down. And I can remember 
feeling that way too. And so how can we kind of normalize that or set that as an expectation rather than something that's wrong with you when you're in the middle of a program and not sure what you're doing? So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So this is a great question. So the idea that both students and experts said more mice and the experts in the room assumed that the reason you would get more mice is in order to have better statistical power or statistical analyses. We are finding that they're separating out the two in interviews. We see this in physics as well. There's this tendency to like, well, I don't know what to do. Let's just do more of it. Right without a, I'm doing more of it in order to increase my sample size and thinking about that. So, so more is really attractive, um, but, I, but what we're finding is attractive for different reasons in the two groups. So yeah, great question, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how much did they really learn? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then we can go that I'll answer this first question first. So the question was about surveying. So this idea of um, you have pre post and you also aren't sure if the students really care about the questions you're asking. Are they taking it seriously? And then this whole idea of what do you think you learned versus what did you actually learn? I'll take the third one first. I think it's really important that we come up with learning goals where we measure what they learn. So similarly, the critical thinking, we weren't asking, do you think you're a better critical thinking thinker at the end of the semester? Because absolutely you find people will want to agree to that statement. Um, and we saw that um, in many of the scoping review studies. So they would say um, at the end of the field course, do you think you learned a lot in this course? And of course they, <laughs> they said that they learned a lot. And so really thinking about ways to pre-post measure um, that don't account, you can account for opinion, but mostly account for knowledge gains, I think is really important. So for the critical thinking, I will admit, it's a lot easier to convince students to do all of these things pre because they're not quite sure what counts yet. And so if we say we have this assignment, um, please fill it out, it's really important for this course we'll find that they are really taking it seriously. Um, post, we have to kind of up it a bit. So we have to say, look, we understand you're busy. We need to know how to improve this course for the future. It's really critical that you take some time and that we value it so much that we will give you these participation points or these extra credit points. And in exchange, we're asking you to take it seriously. It doesn't mean that 100% of them are. We have ways of filtering the data by um, basically people who are taking it faster than reading speed. And so we will remove some of those. Um, then thinking about like how to, I, th I think a lot about taking measures in a way, not that I'm sneaking around about taking measures, but that students don't feel that I'm <laughs> there, you know, monitoring their every move. And that's why things like building it into journaling, I think could be really important because it's already part of the culture that we promote in these courses. We, you know, we talk about the early days of journals and how much we've learned from journaling historically. And so if we can work these things into assignments they know to expect and they know are valuable, um, I think it's a new way of getting a rich 
uh, data set that we might not have had access to, um, especially over time before. Did you have another question or? No, that was all, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. Oh. Okay, great. <laughs> we'll keep going with the live audience. Yeah. Um, I, so the, sorry, the question is about natural history. Do we find any trends? I'm guessing, uh, I don't recall, but I'm guessing because we don't have a large enough sample size. Um, if half this is it, true, you could have geoscience natural history, but I'm guessing there are fewer and half of the 60 articles for geoscience. Um, we can go back and check, but I think we, in the end, we had sort of no one category that was large enough to do that. But that that could be an interesting scoping review for the future. So, yeah. We have time for one more question. We don't have any. We have eighteen participants online, but none of them have been able to participate. Yeah. I touched on this, but didn't unpack it at all. What do you feel like there are common um, sources of this variance? Yeah, so the question is, um, do I feel that there are common um, groups or people who are being excluded? Um, so one thing we've now done is we've gone back through the journals in a very targeted way to look at challenges and barriers that the students write about. So just going back through and categorizing those. The same time we ran a bunch of demographic variables in the background um, to see if you know women versus men or first generation students versus not. Um, the only difference that really showed up was prior field work. So students without prior field work found a lot more challenges and barriers than with. And in some ways, I feel like this is a really powerful way to connect groups of people because. Um, we can just talk about prior field experiences. So um, a lot of thinking about how to prepare them to what they'll expect, what they need to bring. Um, one thing that's been suggested is having um, cards that students write questions on and pass them up and you go through them as a way of um, being able to draw those questions out without drawing attention to a particular students. Um, admittedly, we did not have a lot of students with disability, physical disabilities in our courses, although actually one of the instructors um, has a disability that makes it difficult for them to teach. But I, so I think um, more work is definitely needed in that area. So if, if, I, it's, it's the noon hour, so I'm gonna <laughs> um, bring our formal um, session to a close. Before I ask you to thank Michelle again, I will point out um, she's going to join us at lunch. And so anyone who wants to join that discussion is welcome. Uh, from one to two in room 173, or we might put a note and go outside, <laughs> um, is an open discussion. A tradition that we have for education guests is to have an open discussion. So anyone who can come, who wants to come and keep conversing um, with, Michelle about this is, is welcome to come. Her 30 minute slot schedule is full through four o'clock, but she'll be joining us at happy hour um, at four o'clock. So those are um, opportunities for you to connect. The natural history question, um, I'm looking forward to discussing that at the um, one o'clock open discussion because it's definitely something I've thought a lot about and look forward to. Yeah. to talking about. So um, so please um, come to any of those that you're interested in. And now um, let's thank Michelle for a really great seminar. Thank you.